Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name's Jane, and I'm an alcoholic. And I am so happy to be here tonight. I've heard so much about this meeting from so many people. Um, It's really an honor and a privilege to get asked by Alcoholics Anonymous to do something like this. You know, the way that I look at it is really anybody, anyone in this group could be up here behind the podium tonight. It just happens to be me tonight. I, uh, I kind of was secretly wishing when Lyle was asking for volunteers, does anyone want to get behind the podium and share tonight? Somebody would have raised their hand and let me off the hook, but here I am. And um, I want to start out by just saying how grateful I am to be a part of this precious, life-saving, life-sustaining, life-giving program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I am happy to say that my sober date is September 24th, 1996, And my home group is 909 Central Group in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, And I have a sponsor, and I sponsor. And I try to do everything that I can for this program, including flying all the way to the other side of the United States. Um, But that actually blows my mind because I don't really consider myself a speaker. I just, you know, have a story. I think it's a powerful story of hope that I just get up and share, and um, I'm super nervous. Uh, I actually am dressed for, like, I actually bought boots. I mean, I'm coming to Washington. I had no idea that the weather was going to be this beautiful. Um, it's amazing, and I had the most beautiful day today. And before I go any further, I just want to thank everybody who is responsible for this meeting, for getting me here. Um, Mark did a tremendous job being the host. Uh, I'll tell you, he picked me up at the airport with his beautiful daughter. He's here tonight with his beautiful mom. And today we had just a fantastic day in Seattle. Um, I actually have a niece who's uh, doing a college internship from New York, and uh, we were able to spend the afternoon with her seeing the sights. It was really a, a magically special afternoon. So thank you to Mark, and thank you for our taper who helps to disperse the stories. Um, He was sharing with me about an incredible website where you can have access to stories and um, and uh, the the how far reaching the the stories have been something like 12 countries. He was able to keep track. I mean, that's amazing. So what you do is really a vocation. I don't know about anyone else, but when I first got sober, speaker tapes were meant everything to me. I'm one of those alcoholics that lost my license for life. And um, so Quite often, I didn't wasn't able to go to me- meetings, and uh, I have a unfortunately a tragic story to tell. One of triumph too. I'm here to you know say with a smile, but um, it involves some pretty painful times, and I am forever grateful for some of the speakers um, that spoke to me through their CDs and told me just what I needed to hear at any given moment, you know, in time. I think we all know that feeling. You know, even when we go to meetings sometimes, we're like, oh, gosh, I don't want to go to a meeting. And then you go, and boom, somebody drops a pearl of wisdom, and it was just that one line or that one phrase that made the meeting worthwhile for you. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, and, again, I am humbled that I am commissioned by Alcoholics Anonymous today to share my story. Um, I, I'll i tell you, the... I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the will of God never takes me where the grace of God doesn't protect me. And so I feel kind of protected tonight. Um, I always like to take a moment to invite grace into the room. Um, I, you know, the grace of so many people that was God given is the reason why we're all here today. You know, um, this is a pretty big group, and I feel like I'm looking out in many ways at a group of people who probably should be dead. And instead, we're all here, and um, I know that all of us have undergone that that spiritual transformation that happens when we walk through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. So just take, I just want to take a moment to um, 
be grateful for that, whatever it was, that moment of clarity that got us here, that got us into the program that led us to be in here tonight. Uh, and what a wonderful feeling uh, I have from from just standing up here. Um, you know, the energy of the group is part of what makes this fellowship so beautiful. So I want to thank you in advance for the positive energy that's being sent my way right now. But I thought um, it would be good, I always like to center, um, to say a prayer. Um, and I invite you to bow your heads and join me um, in saying the fourth step prayer. It is I who has made my life a mess. I've done it, and I cannot undo it. My mistakes are mine, and I will begin a searching and fearless moral inventory. I will write down any wrongs, but I will also include that which is good. I pray for the strength to complete this task. And I don't know, I, I felt compelled to share that today because two people today shared with me that they were doing their fourth step. And so often um, we put that step off and, uh, you know, it, it can cause us to relapse. And um, I pray that even newcomers or even people who have been in the program for a long time and are feeling complacent have the courage to go back and to keep revisiting that fourth step. It's so important. It's actually vital. Um, and uh, those of you who are working on it right now, I, I wish you the spirit of honesty, the spirit of um, having the courage to look through your own self-deceptions that sometimes uh, guard the truth from us. And um, and thank you again for just letting me share that prayer. Um, I, I really feel that um, I need to be centered to do this. It's a tremendous honor, but it's also uh, a responsibility. So, let me start with what I'm supposed to start with, what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. And I'll start with from the very beginning. I was born on November 20th, 1962, in a town that's about a half, a, half a, uh, an hour west of the George Washington Bridge in New Jersey, a town called Caldwell, New Jersey. And um, I was born into a big family. I, there are five kids in my family. I'm the second oldest, the oldest girl. My mom and dad uh, just celebrated their 59th wedding anniversary. Uh, and I swear they have the happiest marriage I've ever seen. I, I am so lucky and so fortunate. And that's one of the reasons why I love speaker meetings, because we hear like the whole gamut, don't we? We hear stories about people who have had really difficult childhoods, um, people who have undergone tremendous trauma, all the way to the other side of the gamut, which is where I would fall, people who have no reason to be an alcoholic. I was raised in a wonderfully loving family. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad um, was, you know, was old school. Dad was the one to bring home the bread and butter. He was uh, pretty much a disciplinarian. Uh, just to give you an idea about my dad, because I'm also very proud of him. I like to give him a shout out when I can. But he was actually favored to be the first ever to break the four-minute mile. And guess what? He missed it by 4.00.02. <laughs> what a disappointment. He could have gone down in history if it weren't for that 0.02 of seconds, right? So, um, so it says a lot about his sense of discipline, his work ethic, and his high expectations of himself, but also as us, as his children. And um, so he set the bar really high for us. I mean, there was no doubt in our minds from when we were kids that we were going to college. He was really old school like that. My mom, too, was very old school, uh, and she was a stay-at-home mom. Her job was to love us and nurture us, and that she did. Um, you know, I grew up with my mom and dad always telling me how beautiful and intelligent and funny I was. And, um, again, there, you know, there, there were things in retrospect that I look at now that were a little off, you know, things like they were judgmental in many ways. Um, in many ways, their love was conditional. Um, but, but I obviously don't want to blame anything that happened to me on my parents or really anyone in my family. Um, 
We, the blood that courses through my veins is 100% Irish. Uh, I think that automatically, uh, genetically predisposes me to alcoholism. And um, my, we went to Catholic schools. Um, I actually went to a, a Catholic elementary school, an all-girl Catholic high school, and a Catholic college. Um, so the Irish Catholic thing runs, uh, runs hard and runs deep in my family. And I remember from, uh, from the youngest age just loving God. And I kind of felt like I always had to be a good girl because God was watching out for me. God was looking at me and, and uh, judging me all the time. So I really tried to be a good girl. Um, I was gregarious and, and, um, you know, mischievous and, um, I I had three older brothers, so I was a tomboy, but I loved my childhood. I really did. Um, my rebellion didn't start until, you know, high school. And, um, as I just mentioned, I went to an all girl Catholic high school. I graduated in 1981 and there were only 81 girls in my class. And I'm really grateful for that experience of being in an, an all-girl environment. I mean, and um, I had some awesome nuns who really le- t- taught us to be independent and, you know, leaders. And I, I really um, am grateful for, for that environment. And I also was like the all-American kid in high school, too. I was in the choir. I was, you know... In the drama club, I was in, you know, did all these sports, of course, track. Uh, and I, um, I got the best of my high school years. I remember, um, only one time I smoked pot and only one time I got drunk. And both times that I did both of those things, I said, I am never doing it again. As a matter of fact, um, I was 14 when I, um, first got drunk and I was with my older cousin and she was like 18 and we went to the movies and the we went to see the original Star Wars and I remember my cousin kept dumping rum into my coke and I kept drinking it and I remember being like "Woo!" you know oh my gosh because back in the day we had never seen anything like that and I swear I was flying right there alongside Han Solo and you know in the Falcon Millennium and and I just remember, you know, sitting in my chair and, and really it's, it, it amazes me now when I look at the symbolism of that because that first drunk just took me out of this world and put me into a, on a whole other plane into a new galaxy, you know, and at the time I loved it, but man, did I get sick. I got so sick. I, 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 you know, said that I would never do it, do it again. The same thing with the first time that I smoked weed. I got like this crazy, paranoia. It happened to be on Halloween too. And, um, you know, I just was like, oh my God, I'm never doing that again. And, um, believe it or not, I didn't do it again until I went to college and I went to Manhattan college and in college I had, um, most of my friends, uh, were like Italian or Catholic and they went to private schools like I did. So it was almost like, you know, I saw them drinking and partying and doing all this stuff. It was almost like, okay, I guess this is what you do in college. And, you know, I started experimenting, but I drank like you wouldn't believe. My first semester, I actually put on 25 pounds. And believe me, it was not the food. (laughs) It was definitely the beer and it was drinking. And that's when I, you know, started smoking pot and um, I also forgot to tell you that I graduated second in my class in high school, and we talked about it today um, with Mark, and then I went to college, and I just kind of became a number, you know, and I realized that I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, and, you know, so I kind of just really got involved in the party scene, and um, for some reason, I jammed at midterms, and I jammed at finals, and uh, I was blessed with a good brain, and I could, you know, I could uh, really jam when I needed to jam. And, um, and I, I did fine. Um, sophomore year. Now, remo- I, I need to make this really clear too. This was New York City in the 1980s. And it was almost like this sheltered, uh, you know, Catholic girl let loose in the biggest, baddest city on earth. And when I tell you at that time, it's just like what the movies show. It was, like the Eagles say, it was everything all the time. It was life in the fast lane. And let me tell you, I was on that highway, full speed ahead. And um, I, where Manhattan College was, was the last line, uh, the last stop on the one train. So I had access to Manhattan all the time. 
And, um, and honestly, I, at the beginning, I really thought like I was more, well, I know I was, I, it was like I was more addicted to the social life, you know? I was out, and this is the time of, you know, the clubs like, like the Limelight, Studio 54, the Peppermint Lounge, and I was out all the time. And, um, and I didn't want to miss anything. I was in this phase of life where, you know, okay, down the line, I'm going to calm down. I'm going to, you know, chill out. But right now I am grabbing life by the horns and I am going to live it. And this is the great, the perfect opportunity to do it because I was away from my parents and, you know, so anyway, but sophomore year was when, um, I also started to, um, to really get into cocaine as well. And, um, as you can imagine, well, first of all, I want to say I am totally about singleness of purpose. But for me, like, I think um, alcohol, like, led me to do other things. It led me to do a lot of crazy things. We all know what some of those crazy things are, right? Like, you know, writing bad checks, um, stealing, sleeping with somebody you normally wouldn't sleep with, waking up in places you don't know how you got there, you know, and sometimes it involves going to the ATM and getting a lot of money and going out and scoring some drugs. So that's how I like to, you know, to justify talking about that. Plus, I'm honest, and drugs are a big part of my story, too. But don't don't um, kid yourself. I certainly was an alcoholic, and alcohol was the, the drug of my choice. I loved drinking. I loved planning drinking. I loved everything about it. I loved how it made me feel. I loved the fact that I so I considered myself to be a plain Jane. As soon as I had a couple of drinks in me, I was extraordinary Jane. I was, you know, crazy Jane. And, you know, I loved, you give me a dare, I'm doing it, you know. And it was also sort of a time of rebellion because I knew that my, especially my mother, you know, she, my mother should have been a nun, okay, and um, she started to, you know, disapprove of my lifestyle, and it just drove me further into it. It was almost like, oh, yeah, you think that's how I am? Well, watch this, and um, and that was like the story of my life. It just started to, you know, just get out of, more and more out of control. So junior year, I was really feeling it, man. I was getting tired, and I had the opportunity to uh, spend a semester abroad, so I jumped on it. I took French four years in high school, two years in college, and I had an opportunity to study in France. So that became my first geographic change. It was like, you know what? I'm getting out of here. I'm going somewhere. I'm starting clean slate. I'm going to do great in school. I'm going to concentrate on my studies. And, you know, boom. And we know what happened, right? I went over to France. I lived with a French divorcee and her 11-year-old son, and they had a 19-year-old nanny living with them, a French nanny, and her and I became partners in crime, and we tore up that little city of Nantes just like we did New York, and she was very connected. So we, the same thing happened. You, you know, you know the drill. Wherever we go, we go with us, right? And I started, um, you know, just really getting out of control when I was in France, too. Thank goodness that was a fa pass-fail program, because let me tell you, I passed by the skin of my teeth. But I had a great opportunity to do a lot of travel. After um, that, that semester, I had the opportunity to backpack through Europe. So um, I remember I had, I had the train ticket, you know, the student rate was pretty cheap. And then I had $300 to last me for a month and a half. Well, first stop was Amsterdam, where I had to load up on uh, some fun stuff to do the rest of the trip, and I spent like $150 there. And then the second place was London, where I spent the other 150 bucks getting my hair done. And uh, I remember it was back, like, ni vintage 1984, right? Like, it was shaved up this side and bright pink with white shoots coming out the front. You have know, wearing, like, clothes from the 1940s, vintage clothes. I mean, I had it going on. And um, And then, you know, really the rest of the time, it was just that. It was like, you know, sleeping on benches, sleeping on beaches, sleeping wherever. And everywhere I met, I went, I met party people. It was like this, I was this magnet for party people. And I don't know, I look back on it, it's like, how did we do that? And how did we send off those vibes? And, you know, and anyway, but I did. And we had such a great time. You know, so often it cracks me up because people in AA, you know, even sponsors or whatever in the past have said, 
Jane, you just think you were having a great time. I'm like, no, I was having a great time. I really was. So, um, so anyway, um, you know, I went back to New York and once again, I said, okay, now I got to get serious. And, you know, I'm about to like enter the workplace or, you know, the, uh, enter the field of employment and I need to, you know, get my stuff together. And things just got even worse. I, um, I went back and I, uh, started dating like the biggest Coke dealer on campus. The party had never stopped. The drinking became even, uh, more out of control. And, um, that's when like my morals just started to really, um, slide. That's when, um, I started to cross all those lines that I said I would never cross, you know? And it was very insidious. It happened, you know, a progression of events. But, um, Again, because of my innocent looks, I uh, ended up getting out of college, getting a great job teaching high school. I taught high school English and French, and I lived in this little city called Hoboken, New Jersey. And it was right across the river from Manhattan. You know, I, I was like, my justification was, well, at least I'm out of New York City, you know, on the other side of the river, but it's in reachable distance, but at least I won't be going out every night. Well, they have this thing called the path train that goes back and forth. And my, and the same thing just continued. You know, my first year teaching, um, I started, uh, you know, I started a relationship with a married man who was also a teacher. I, um, I don't know how, how I did the stuff that I, that I did to tell you the truth. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, I do know how I did the stuff that I did with the assistance of, uh, some chemicals. And, um, but I would, I remember just, night after night, just staying up all night, going home to shower and going to work. And I don't know how I did that, but it was almost like I had this crazy, sick work ethic instilled in me from my dad. And it's like, you know, you do what you're going to do, have fun, but you show up and you, you know, make sure you show up for your commitments. And I kind of really did rock at old school like that. I, I very seldom miss school, but the condition that I went was sometimes, you know, atrocious. So anyway, um, and then I also had this streak of rebellion in me. Like I loved, um, you know, I loved shocking people. Um, I loved like hanging out in the biker bars. I loved hanging out in the ghetto. I loved hanging out in, um, you know, the artsy te parts of New York. I loved, ju I just love, I'd wanted everyone to love me and to not look at anything. I didn't want to look at anything else except for a loving human being in front of me. And, um, I think that was like, uh, a big part of my, my deal was I, I started to become a risk taker and go into neighborhoods that, um, were, you know, incredibly dangerous. And I started to get that like real, um, adrenaline junkie kind of risk taking thing in me. And, um, it was really very dangerous. Some of the things that I did, um, I can't believe I made it out alive, but, um, but anyway, that started to become my life. And, um, and once again, I had the opportunity to get out of New York. Um, I actually, um, I had a friend who I taught high school with who was like, Jane, you got to get out of here. And, um, and I was like, I know I need to start fresh somewhere. And he had just gotten back from a sabbatical in Japan. So I was like, oh my gosh, I heard there's like no drugs in Japan. I heard, uh, you know, if you get caught with like a joint, you go to prison for seven years, that will stop me. And, um, and also I just needed to get away from some of the relationships that I was in that were no good, including that, that married man. And, you know, anyway, so I went on the interview with this guy who was, uh, interviewing in all the big cities like LA, Chicago, Manhattan, um, Miami. And, um, I remember as soon as I met him, he was this good looking guy from England and, um, I remember after the interview, I said, he, I said to him, so have you seen New York? And he's like, no, I've actually been holed up and doing these interviews. I was like, you want to go see New York? He was like, that would be great. So we went out and did, did, our, did the thing in Manhattan. We, I mean, I got crazy drunk. We got, anyway, I got the job. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> and two weeks later, I was on a plane to Japan. You know, and everyone was like, what? But that was part of my thing. I loved shocking people. I'm like, yeah. And plus, it was almost like to my family, who by this time was no longer inviting me to family functions. 
Um, and I remember one time on a New Year's Eve, I, I called to wish my family a happy New, Year, uh, happy New Year, and they were all together and didn't invite me. And I remember, like, my reaction to that was just like, watch this. And I remember going out and picking somebody up and having a one-night stand to get back at them. You know what I mean? Like, that was kind of the state of mind that I was in. So anyway, I went to Japan, and I remember actually I was sitting on the plane next to some guy, and he's like, you're going to Japan, and you just decided to go. Do you speak any Japanese? And I was like, yeah, I know how to say domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> that, that's about it. And um, so I, I got to Japan, and, um, and again, uh, I, I swore up and down, Nobody knows me here except for that guy, and he was in Tokyo, and I was in a city called Nagoya, and I'm going to, you know, really start living the right life. Well, we know the end to that story, right? I ended up working for, um, and I always got great jobs. Uh, so I got this job teaching um, Japanese businessmen, because back in those days, in the 80s, it was all businessmen who were um, to be immersed in English classes. So I had to st stay at the training centers with them, sometimes for a month. And we would ha eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. They weren't allowed to speak any Japanese. It had to be all English. And every night we went out drinking. Every night. And that's when the really good cultural exchanges went down, by the way. But, um, but... But it was just, it, it was, and I got away with everything in Japan, too, because I was a foreigner. I mean, they used to have a line for us. It was like henna gaijin, crazy foreigners. And I met the craziest Brits, Canadians, Australians, uh, New Zealanders. I mean, all these um, people that were in Japan just tearing it up and having fun and knew we would do whatever we wanted to do without getting arrested. And that's kind of how it was. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go for a year. I ended up staying for three. And again, that, you know, I was having a good time up to a certain point, but it started to really affect my life. I started to wake up shaking in the morning, needing a drink first thing in the morning to chill out. And it was the perfect job for that because they didn't know, you know, or if they did know I was drinking, they didn't care. And, um, and so my life just started to, this is when the real, obvious downward spiral started to happen. Um, a, a friend of mine um, has, she lives in London now, and I went to visit her a couple years ago, and she actually had a journal entry, and she showed it to me, and it said, um, my friend Jane has decided to cut back on her drinking, which means she didn't drink for lunch on Thursday. I was like, oh my God. She said something else about my lifestyle too that I won't share, but, but anyway, um, Things were really, I knew, that's when I started to knew that I had a problem. And, um, and yet I still was very comfortable. It was complacent. And I knew going back to the States would be a whole, a whole new deal. So as, as soon as I got tired enough, though, I came back. And, um, and I ran into disillusionment upon disillusionment. I thought I would get a great job. And instead, I just was doing work in a whole bunch of temp jobs. Um, I was, you know, drinking daily still when I moved back. Um, I moved to Jersey City this time. And um, I, to make a long story short, I got my first DUI. And, um, you know, I, I, I remember when I got it, I, I just pled guilty to it because I was like, man, I drank and drove so many hundreds of times. I'm standing here before you so ashamed of that. But I remember being so drunk, like having to drive the car like this, or forgetting where I parked my car and calling the pound like a week later to find my car, or walking out to find my car parked on the sidewalk. Like, it, you know, I mean, just crazy stuff. And um, so I figured, oh, well, I'm not going to plead guilty. I was guilty, you know, whatever. I'll, you know, take the hit and whatever. So I, it was about this time, too, where my family wasn't talking to me at all. My siblings were like, Jane, man, you are, you got to, you you're, it's too painful to be around you, and it's painful to watch mom and dad around you. And what did I do? That just, you know, led me further into it. So a friend of mine actually um, at that time was like, you got to get out of there. You, you can't live there anymore, you know. And he was actually living in Florida. And I, he said, come down. You know, you can uh, get a job here. 
you can ride your bike everywhere, um, and you know, I'll get you a job. You'll be, you can waitress making at least a hundred bucks a night. And I was like, okay, I'm doing it. So I kid you not, I had every intention of moving down to the Florida Keys to get sober. Now, if anyone knows the Florida Keys, you know how absurd that is. And it was in the Florida Keys where um, I I hit that level of my life that was that incomprehensible demoralization. You know, I used to pride myself on the vodka that I drank, and now I was drinking pop-off out of a bottle. I, I, you know, used to love snorting cocaine, and now I was smoking it. And um, I remember I got down, like after about four months, I got down to like 85, 90 pounds. And I remember like I would just touch something and my whole arm would turn black and blue. That's how malnourished I was. You know, I actually, to be honest, I was on the road of self-destruction. I wanted to kill myself, but I didn't have the courage to do it. So I thought I would just take myself out like that, like drinking and not waking up smoking and blowing my heart up or something. I didn't know. I didn't care. It was a really deep, dark period of my life that makes me sick when I think about it. And, you know, I had the proverbial, you hear this all the time. I one time looked in the mirror and I was like, oh my God, who is that person? I look like a skeleton. I mean, I was hollow. My eyes were hollow. I was dead, spiritually dead. And um, I had uh, my first little moment of clarity, and I had a cousin who lived up in Fort Lauderdale, and I, and I to this day I can't believe she did this because she had four kids that were under ten, and she said, "Come on up here and live with us for a while, and get we'll help you get back on your feet," and so I did, and um, I, to be honest, I still drank every day. But I did it in, in a more controlled fashion, like at night. I wasn't drinking when I woke up in the morning anymore because, you know, she was there and whatever. And she didn't really know the extent of how bad things were, so I was getting away with it. And I got a temp job in downtown Fort Lauderdale, met a great guy, and um, really started to, you know, try and get my life together. And this guy um, was actually living in Europe at the time. And he was, um, you know, really smart and funny and whatever. And um, he wanted to go, he started an adventure tour package uh, or an adventure tour company. And he wanted to make this package about like water sports. So he said, why don't we go down to the Florida Keys? And I was like, oh my God, but okay. You know, and, um, and I remember we got down there and the first tiki bar we had hit, boom, had a drink and we progressed and did that all the way down to Marathon Key. And in Marathon Key, they have this thing called the Seven Mile Bridge. I don't know if any, anyone's ever heard of it, but if you've seen that movie True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's like this scene where they're driving down the bridge, and remember they blow up the bridge. Well, we um, went out, when we got there, we were like, let's go down that bridge. It, it's the, the scenic overview point. And I remember going down there, seeing a sign that said authorized vehicles only. And I was just like, Oh, well, vehicles, let's go. You know, we'll go down the bridge. And um, we were, and I remember it was just really wild because it was just like this road that just kept going. I had never been on a bridge like that. And um, and we were on it for several minutes, and then all of a sudden I went around this little curb and there was like this thunderous crack and this bolt of lightning that just went through my very being. And I remember just like not being able to move and just being like mesmerized and dazed. And I don't know how long I was like that. But when I opened my, my eyes, I saw the, the smoke and the fire. And what I did was I actually rammed into um, one of those cement blockades that on the other side of it was water. And if I hit that wall any further, we would have gone right over and into the water. And instead, I just remember sitting there like, oh, my God, where did that thing come from? Oh, my God, Max, how are we going to get out of this? Oh, my God. You know, and I remember putting my hand down to my ankle and put my hand up, and there was just blood dripping, and I felt the bones in my ankle, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I remember grabbing his hand and shaking him and, 
And it looked like he hit his head and he was passed out. And I just kept shaking him like, Max, wake up, wake up. And he was just still. And it didn't take me long to figure out that he wasn't breathing and that he was dead. You know, it's this weird thing, you guys. Like, when I talk about it, it's still, like, very very surreal for me. Like, I can't believe it happened. And I remember screaming, God, please take me too. There's no way I'm going to be able to live with myself. You know, uh, how can this happen? And, uh, oh, my God, you know. And then, and then I remember every breath that I took was, like, a conscious effort because my lo- my. Uh, ribs punctured my lungs and I was just breathing like (gasps) and I remember you know being the good Catholic girl saying my act of contrition and trying to get right with God and I remember thinking oh my God I can't do this to my family and oh my God his family there's no way I'm going to be able to live with myself and I remember I, the next thing I remember is just, you know, this flurry of lights, and it had to be, you know, hours later. And I knew, like, I was on my last breaths when they appeared. And um, I remember the police officer being so nice and just saying, hang in there, we're going to get you out of here. And, um, you know, they had to get the jaws of life. And then um, I, I, I remember I couldn't move, and they had to heliport me into Miami. And the next thing I remember was just being on this weird bed, being tilted back and forth, and my neck just stationary, and and me just crying, the tears coming down my face, and my dad was right in front of me. And I remember the first thing I said to my dad was, Dad, it didn't happen because I was drinking. When you think of that denial... And I remember that look on his face, just like, oh my God, Janie, what is it going to take? Are you kidding me? And, you know, my mother was just devastated. My mother just, I mean, she took her own journey. She chose to cut me out and not talk to me and not be there for me through this. And But my dad was there. And honestly, I would have thought it would have been the other way. But my mom was so filled with guilt and shame and anger. She just couldn't deal with it. She checked out. So uh, I'm going to fast forward because I hate that part of my story. But, uh, you know, honestly, I I wish I could say that was the last time I drank, but it wasn't. And um, I was in a physical therapy place for six months. And I actually broke my neck at C1, C2 which is the same fracture that Christopher Reeve had. And, you know, a third of the people that get that die instantly, a third are paralyzed, and a third are brain damaged. So when I tell you, like, I'm not kidding when I say I am a miracle. It's a miracle that I'm here, and I'm still trying to figure out why. But um, who knows, maybe somebody needed to hear something that I said tonight, because, man, when I tell you, I was in the pit of hopelessness. I wanted to die so bad. I prayed to die. So anyway, um, fast forward, um, because of the previous DUI, and I had another DUI. I knew I was looking at a lot of time in prison. I was looking at 15 years. And um, and I decided to, I, we got an attorney, and actually my mom and dad almost got divorced over that. Like, I'm not just saying that because my dad was like, she's our daughter. We have to stick by her. And whatever. my mother was like, she made her bed, let her lay in it. And um, my siblings had to intervene. And, and thank God my parents started going to a support group for addicts and alcoholics. Um, it wasn't Al-Anon, but it was, you know, the same kind of program in New Jersey. That's what was uh, available. And um, thank goodness they went to that because they both became educated on alcoholism and addiction. And uh, to make this very long story short, as soon as I was able to walk, I went before a judge, pled guilty, and got sentenced to five years in prison, followed by 10 years of probation. And um, in Florida, you do 85% of your time, and 
I sure I did 85% of my time. So um, prison, I could talk about that for the next half hour. Um, one of my biggest resentments is that I did not write Orange is the New Black. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have the name of my book. My family was hardcore. They did not send me any money in prison. They told everybody she's in there to be punished. I remember my mother saying, you think we're going to send you money so you can drink Coca-Cola and eat potato chips? I don't think so. You know, that was the attitude that they had. And my, um, and, you know, my siblings didn't do it. So they were just into the tough love thing. So I never had any money. So the name of my book would have been, I'm nobody's boo because I'm a broke ass bitch. <laughs> and I was, I was broke. Let me tell you something. I, I would not do anything to violate my probation because I did not want to go back to prison. Well, I met some of the finest women I've ever met in my life in there. Um, every day, not having your freedom is an atrocity. You know, the humiliation, the degradation, it, it's, a, it's a lot. And, um, but I can tell you that every day there was a lesson. And um, I tried to make good of my time there. You know, I, I, um, the first two years I was there, I started a literacy program. And then the last three, almost three, I um, pre helped women prepare for their GED. So I worked, you know, every day to keep busy and actually, that's when I really got into um, the 12-step program. So all of you who do, who bring meetings into prisons and jails, God bless you, because that was life-changing for me. I wanted what those women had. I knew that someday I would walk out and be able to connect with those women, and I did. As a matter of fact, the day I got out of prison, I, got, I had my hefty bag, got in the cab, uh, went to the mall and got the gray washed out of my hair, and the next thing I did was I went to my AA meeting, 909 Central Group that I talked about. That's still my, my home group today. And guess what? The women that bought the meetings into prison were there. They were like, oh, my God, when did you get out? I was like, today! They were like, oh, my gosh! <laughs> and I kid you not, in the, in the taxi the, the, on the radio station was playing Skinner's Freebird. I'm not kidding. And I mean, I was sitting in the back seat crying, and the cab driver was like, why are you crying? I was like, I just got out of prison, you know, because it was actually a work release center. And he was like, oh, my God, and he turned it up and started singing it with me. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I then started my new life. And I'll tell you something. I, uh, I'm so grateful that I, I, I was able to go to that meeting with such an open mind. And I remember the old-timer there said, Young lady, you never have to be alone again. And man, was he right. Um, what do you hear this? My probation, that's why it cracks me up when probationers want, you know, have to get their meeting thing, the meeting thing signed or people lose their license for six months. I'm like, I lost my license for life. And for my probation, are you ready for this? I had to go to an AA meeting every day. Even my probation officer was like, I never heard of this before. I was like, huh. Oh. And so I, I got an apartment close to the AA meetings. It was a meeting house that was, you know, three blocks away so I could walk to it. I hated it in the beginning. I was, like, you know, so resentful. And, but I, I grew to love it. And, um, and I'll tell you something. They saved my life, you know, really. I started, it was very insidious how it happened. But, you know, and, I, and the one thing that I knew from my spon first sponsor back then was, no matter what problems arose, the answer was only 12 steps away. And that is so true, right? Every problem that we have in life, there's an answer for it, a solution for it, I should say, in the big book. So, um, so I learned that, and it just I started to try to not be resentful about anything in my life. I tried to reframe everything in a positive mode. And I, that was a choice, believe me, because my life was tough. Rebuilding my life is not easy. Having the stigma of being an ex-offender is not easy. And so I got my first job, and even that was tough to get. And I was a housekeeper in um, a Marriott hotel. And I swear to God, that was like the best job that I could have gotten. I was so grateful to have that job, and it was hard to get that. I remember looking at the woman saying, you know, please, please give me a second chance. Um, you know, where would any of us be without forgiveness? And, um, and what I found, too, is that a lot of people want to be part of a success story and want to, want to give people a second chance. And so it seemed like at every curve in my recovery, there was like an angel waiting there to, to lift me up, you know? 
So then I started to get really into, um, you know, the AA program there. And, um, and uh, while I was in prison, too, I, I did, I worked with a sponsor as well on the outside, my sponsor that I had before I, I left and um, before I went into prison. And um, the, the last use that I had, in case anyone was wondering, was a week before I went into prison. And, um, and it was horrible. It was the bottom that, uh, you know, that was what I needed to happen to me. You would have thought what happened to me was enough. But I think it's only natural when something like that happens to just want to drink yourself and escape into oblivion all the time. So I did that while I was going to AA, and I was honest with people about it. And, you know, I could see even in my sponsor's eyes, she's like, you're going to prison for 15 years. I get why you're feeling like that, and I get why you have to do that. That's what we do. But um, but I still had, um, you know, enough love and um, and support that I knew when I got out would be waiting for me. Um, and that that last use, September 24th, 1996, was the worst. It involved everything, alcohol, drugs, one night stand. And I remember like at about, you know, six in the morning with that feeling of like, oh my God, the world just crashing on me. Like everything that I did just at the forefront of my mind and I just wanted to die. And I'm surprised I didn't kill myself that night. And of course I was afraid about going into prison and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I felt like I needed to clarify my last use. Um, and that's how sick I still was before, before I went into prison. So I am grateful for the five years that I had in prison. As a matter of fact, I got invited to share my story down in the Florida Keys and the woman who was my host worked for the court system. And guess what? My judge came. It was a gratitude dinner. My judge came and heard my story and it was on the 20th anniversary of the accident you know, like that month. So it was incredible. I was able to go up to that judge and hug her and thank her because I feel like she helped save my life too. You know, I needed five years in prison, man. I needed, I needed to go on a mining expedition to find out who I was. I needed the, the true knowledge of the 12-step program to, to sink in. And while I was in prison, I was actually able to do a lot of, you know, 10, 11, 12 you know, and, um, and anyway, I really tried to be of service all the time when I was in there. And, um, and I really value the, the time that I had in prison. Uh, honestly, it saved my life. So what it's like, to, what is it like today? Um, well, I, my life today is incredible. It was a long journey. Um, I went from being a housekeeper to working at the front desk to um, applying, I was, I ended up in, uh, randomly in Tallahassee, Florida, which is where Florida State University is, and um, I tried vehemently to get my teaching certification, and they were like, no way, you, you have a felony, you are never teaching again, so kiss that goodbye. So I decided to go back to school, um, and I figured, what better job than to be a social worker if I wanted to live a life of love and service? So um, I applied, I got denied once, twice, the third time I finally got in, and my letter uh, ended up landing in the right hands because not only did I get in, but I got an assistantship scholarship. So, um, so anyway, I um, I thanked that that person for giving me this, a second chance. I pleaded for her to give me a second chance, and she she did. And any time anyone gave me a second chance, I did not want to let them down. So I did everything that I could, to, and I, I remember I had to work at the hotel. I had to be at the front desk at se 7. I didn't drive, so I had to leave at 6. So, And then after work at 3, I would go down to school, and I took night classes, and then I'd get home and do my homework. And I did that for two years straight. And I did great at school. I got my MSW. Um, things started to heal within my family. My mom was the one who took the longest, but I, I kept going to meetings. I started sponsoring a lot of women and, um, I started to, you know, and, and in, uh, we all know how that goes in helping others. We help ourselves. I stayed right in the thick of it. And, um, after five years, I went back before the judge and asked her to, you know, please like every day was a bit much. And she said, okay, we'll lower it down to five times a week. I was like, thanks a lot. Five, you know, that's still a lot, but I still did it. And I tried to do everything with a smile on my face because I knew I should be dead. 
So then um, the miracles started happening. I literally just kept doing the next right thing, and all these blessings just started happening. Um, so I got out, and I um, ended up, my first job was in a detox center. Then I worked in a psychiatric hospital in a crisis intervention unit. And, um, and, I re- and then at night, I worked at a place called the Addiction Recovery Center. And um, still, I went to meetings you know, all the time. And the next thing I knew, it was like, um, I had like five years living that lifestyle. The next thing I knew, I got a call from Florida State University and they wanted to know if I would be interested in teaching a class. I was like, what? You know, so it had been like really just six, not uh, seven, eight years or whatever before that I was sitting on a prison bunk. And now I got asked to teach a class at Florida State University. And guess what class it was? Chemical dependency. <laughs> My specialty area. So I started teaching, and um, and believe it or not, like, uh, you know, I, I taught for, I was an adjunct for a couple of years, and I got a call from the dean, and the dean asked me if I wanted to be a full-time faculty member at Florida State. Talk about miracles! I mean, it's unbelievable! So anyway, I actually recently got my promotion, and now I am an assistant teaching professor at Florida State University. And I mean, it just blows my mind. And believe me, I don't say that to boast. I say it like to try and give you know newcomers hope. Like this is the this is the crazy stuff that happens to us when we stay sober. It's unbelievable. And um, and then so that started happening. Like you know, I love my job. I, I ended up um, starting to, you know, date some guys, but nothing really worked out. Um, I, I really, to be honest, it was like I was too busy rebuilding my life to really get, you know, put my heart and soul into a relationship. So anyway, um, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, I actually sp- was asked to share my story at the 2009 Florida State Convention. And um, it was the first time that I spoke at like a really big thing. So I was really nervous. And I, and somebody else, a guy told their story who I just, when he told his story, I was like, oh man, we would have been dangerous together. (laughs) But, um, I remember when I went up to thank him in the line afterwards, I looked at him and I swear I knew he was the one. And, um, I'm happy to say like he was with somebody at the time. I was with somebody at the time. We became Facebook friends. I lived in Tallahassee. He lived in Chicago. We, we uh, you know, kind of saw when each other became single again on Facebook, and, um, and we started dating long distance, and July 30th will be our one-year wedding anniversary. I know, I'm unbelievable. And when I tell you, he is, first of all, he has 33 years sober. I don't know any guy that does more for Alcoholics Anonymous than, than my husband, James. And um, and he is just the most wonderful man that I've ever met. I, I mean, I can't believe this has happened to me at this at this age. You know, like 54, I got married for the first time. I had never even cohabitated before. That's how in- independent I was. So, and it's been great. I mean, honestly, it's just, it's unbelievable. And he's hot, you know? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. And uh, just to share a really crazy um, small world story, because I'm here in Washington, the first time I ever saw went to a convention was right when I got out of prison. I went to a women's conve- uh, retreat called Women in Recovery in um, St. Simons Island, Georgia. And the first speaker I ever saw was Polly P. And you know, many of you know who Polly P. is. Well, guess what? I have the coolest mother-in-law in the world. She's my mother-in-law. So yeah. So I know she lived in Bellingham. So I know she's very loved around here. And, um, but how crazy is that? The first speaker I ever saw is now my mother-in-law and that boy that she talked about neglecting due to her alcoholism is my husband. Isn't that crazy? So anyway, so, um, so right now my life is fantastic. My, uh, I, I've had some difficult times too. I've been, uh, I've been stalked by, uh, uh, mentally ill former student who ended up um, killing himself, but it was a terrorizing nine months because I thought he was going to kill me. And it was not a love thing. It was a hate thing. So I don't know if anyone in here has ever been stalked, but it changes your life. I also um, was diagnosed with breast cancer and, um, you know, I had to go through that, you know, really scary time in my life. 
Um, actually, somebody here was at a women's convention that I had just learned the day before. There she is. That I learned the day before that I got diagnosed. And I remember everyone going, why are you going? Are you just got diagnosed with cancer and you're going on a women's thing? I was like, there's no place I'd rather go. But I remember sharing it from the podium that time, and it, I was really scared and filled with fear, and those women just loved me. And that's the story of my, my life in recovery. Whatever happens, I know that I'm surrounded and supported by love. You know, um, I, I still, we're only human, so I have a lot of imperfections. One of them, and I was sharing with Mark, is resentments, right? I still struggle with resentments. I, sometimes I just can't let things go. And I always like to share... Um, share this because first of all, I love her, but um, I shared this one time with one of my favorite speakers is a nun called Sister B. <laughs> and, um, and I love her. And so she gave me this prayer and I just thought that I would share. It. It's called a prayer for freedom of resentments. God, help me to look with soft eyes upon all who are part of my days. Break through the barriers of my scrutinizing views. Transform my inner landscape into a peaceful place of acceptance. Pull back my projections and my criticisms. Replace my mean measurements and biased expectations with an openness that allows others just to be. Cleanse me of everything that clouds my perceptions and blocks the sunlighted spirit. And I love that prayer so much. And as I said, I strive to grow through my imperfections um, I, I, I remember thankfully all of the people who have helped me in my recovery. My goal in recovery is to be there for all the people who need my help. You know, um, this way of living, uh, is be again, beyond my, my wildest dreams, my expectations. It's just amazing with even the dark times, even everything bad that happens to me, I'm thankful for. And, and I know that I grow from, from each adverse situation that I encounter in life. So in closing, I, um, I just want to let you know, if you're new, it works. It really does. But um, I also wanted to share another prayer. I love my little 12-step prayer book. Um, you know, and, and just remind you that you know, wherever you find yourself, Whenever you find yourself doubting that you can change or doubting that you have, have the courage to get through this, just remember how far you've come. I keep it that simple. You know, look at how far I've come. Even when I have, you know, hard times. Like, let's face it, life is tough sometimes. Work is sometimes hard. You know, life is hard. We all go through grief and we experience deaths. It's not easy. But thank goodness I have the support right here. And everything that I know that I've faced, I've overcome. I know pretty much anything that's put in my path. I can get through with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and with you, you know, by my side. So I love the 12 step prayer. Dear God, my spiritual awakening continues to unfold. The help I have received, I should pass on and give to others, both in and out of the fellowship. For this opportunity, I'm grateful. I pray most humbly to continue walking day by day, on the road of spiritual progress. I pray for the inner strength and the wisdom to practice the principles of this program in all I do and say. I need you, my friends, and the program every hour of every day. This is a better way to live. Thank you all so much, and I wish you a beautiful evening. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.